Hello there. Sarah from 17 once again. This is my Halo 5 Legendary Lone Wolf walkthrough. This is mission 3, it is called Glast, and it's going to introduce you to some of the slightly different features in Halo 5. There are these interesting moments where you actually don't shoot things, and I think they're really interesting, as I just said twice. However, you don't really do that much, and there doesn't seem to be too much that the game allows you to do. So there are these wonderful environments that they've made, and they've filled with these little pockets of humanity and what have you. And you don't really affect it too much, which is a shame because it seems like the kind of thing that could really break up the gameplay. And I'm all for diversification. It just kind of... Um, I don't know. Is it masking loading? What exactly is it achieving? But Strangers in a Distant Land is the, the particular section we're on right now. And we're taking on the Prometheans. Not the Proteans, not the... What were I calling the other one? Protheans, I think I was also saying. One of them is... I think from Mass Effect, the other one is the first of some kind of genus. You know, there's a lot of cool P words that, that speak of things. I, I approve of, uh, of that particular angle of our language, or the English language, I should say. And we're taking on the Prometheans, which I don't think are as fun as the, the Covenant, but they can be fun occasionally. And, like, look how many shots I put on that dude, and he's still in his armor. I don't, I just, I feel strange. And I know it's a Halo staple, but to me, like, you get two headshots, his arm should be gone. And admittedly, I'm not hitting the faces on a lot of these shots, so, you know, I can't really grumble. But it just... I just think it, it makes you feel so weak. It has an emaciation effect on, essentially, your power trip. When, when you think about what we're doing in these games, we're just conquering. We are these badass space marine dudes and we're shooting these aliens. We're essentially, like, border control in some bizarre, you know, future system of... We don't take kindly to outsiders around here, so I'm going to shoot you in the face. Which is a very xenophobic way of thinking, but are we coming onto these strange worlds and kicking away the aliens that look different to us? Hell yes. Are the aliens, you know, being bad? Hell yes. So it's all good. You alien sympathizers, you. <laughs> but uh, this particular piece of conflict here, you can get up onto this roof, get a bit of a height advantage. I never really feel... Like, a height advantage gives you much of an advantage against a computer that has incredibly good accuracy. Because it's just one of those things where they don't have to see much of your body to be able to shoot you. Because all they're doing is pressing a zero on their particular programming structure. And boom, you've just took damage. Whereas we have to move, you know, thumbs and articulate aiming and things. And it's, it's nowhere near as fluid or as precise. And it makes me wonder, you know when we do evolve technology and we create cyborgs or androids, or replicants, whatever TV fiction or movie uh, canon you want to use. Do you think they'll replace us when it comes to video games? Do you think a, a machine would like playing a machine? Or would it look at it as kind of some suedo intellectual slavery? You know, you're abusing my dear friend, Mr. Halo 5. Stop twiddling his knobs! How dare you! Like, do you think it'll... It'll look at it like that, or will it just see it like we do? And be really, really good. Like, stupid good. Like, you cannot play if you are Korean or a robot. I wonder. But this is Halo 5, and that is a tangent that is far too soon to be going on such a ridiculous angle. So I'm going to talk a little bit of Halo. A couple of people have, have mentioned that... I say a couple, I think I read one comment. It said, you can control your team in the game. And this is something that I did not come across in the entire campaign. And I appreciate why this happened. Because I start games on their hardest difficulty. And I think one of the subsets on most games is when you first play them, a bunch of tutorials will automatically pop up and litter the screen to educate you on the new features and the things that you can do. On the hardest difficulty, they generally don't pop up. And if they did, I was too excited or sleep deprived or whatever you want to say that I didn't notice it. So, you can indeed command your team to move, you can command them to focus fire on things, and that's pretty much what you can do, and you do it with the D-pad, I think you press up on the D-pad. In fact, it might be telling me just there. Yeah, it is, that's exactly what it's saying on the screen right now. Press up on the D-pad to shoot it, uh, get your team to shoot things. And I, I, I didn't read it, I just didn't see it, I was too busy, you know, seeing everything else, couldn't see the forest for the trees. 
That is 100% me, guys. 100%. So I'm not going to be commanding my team at all. But I was reading the Giant Bomb review by a guy called Jeff Gertzman, who is a... Uh, well, he used to be one of my favourite journalists until I kind of fell off of game journalism. And he said that when you command your team to do things, generally is a hit or miss mechanic, where there will be moments where you tell them to focus fire on things, and they're too busy firing at a wall. And, and weird things like that so whereas it might help you and it might make, it might make things better you don't have to do it and this walkthrough is going to, to show you that you know you don't need to but every little helps so I would definitely experiment with it I do find it kind of amazing though that I could have played this game for how long did the campaign take me uh, let's let's have a look at it so I started I, I picked the game up on Saturday I could have got it Friday but I, I, I was being lazy I picked it up, I got home about 2, 2 p.m. Might have been a little bit later, maybe half past 2. And then I started playing till about 2 in the morning of uh, in a session. I had a couple of breaks to eat and, and drink and things, but I was pretty much, you know, focused on playing the game. And on Legendary, you know, it's a pretty tough time when you're finding the paths and you're discovering things. And then the next day... It, took me a couple hours, like two or three hours to finish up the, the final few chapters. So, you know, anywhere between 10 to say 15 hours was probably how long I spent actually playing the game, which I think is a decent length for a campaign. A lot of that was due to, to restarting because of, you know, tricky checkpoints and things. So it's a decent length. I spent that entire time playing the game, focused on the game, staring at the game, and I never noticed that hint that said press up, which I think is amazing. And if I had to think of maybe why I didn't click on, it might have been because I thought it was telling me how to do the find, you know, your objective, but I honestly couldn't tell you. And it must be that thing where the human brain processes things and omits them for you, which is a really strange thing that we do. And the more you see something, or similar to when you hear something, for instance, if there's a repetitive noise in your house and you listen to it long enough, your brain will interpret it as, as kind of white noise and blanket it out for you so you can focus on other things. And they can really come to a point where a guest will say, what's that strange noise? And you'll, you'll be completely oblivious because you just stopped listening to it a very long time ago. Because you, you register it as not important and your brain was like, you know, we don't need this, let's stop wasting energy on this process. And it's very similar with, with, you know, looking at things, hence that expression couldn't see the forest before the trees, which sounds really strange, but it's, it's very true. And I don't know if it's because I play on like a 42 inch television and I sit about five inches from it so that my eyeballs, eyeballs are literally like dragging on the screen, but it is amazing to watch this back and see that thing pop up and then have never read it. And I like to think of myself at times as, you know, a pretty observant guy, but it just goes to show. You know, when you're focused on something and it's life and death and you're dying and you're getting shot and you're just, you know, you're hoping for the next checkpoint to come and it's your only ambition, it's so easy to spot the, the minute details. But this is a tricky, tricky level for a few reasons. Uh, there is a firefight coming up later on on it, which is the first area that I actually sped through because I spent about 20 to 30 minutes killing dudes. I had no ammo left and there were still just as many as there was when I began shooting them. And I don't think there's anything more demoralizing than those moments when you just realize how little you've done in spite of how much you did. And I, and I find that to be just really strange. And I'm, I'm curious, guys. Um, and, and I love all the different perspectives that we get on this channel because they're so different to mine. And, like to me, when there's a big firefight and I kill 50 dudes and it still looks like there's 50 dudes left, I don't feel good about that. I don't look at it as, oh, that's more people to kill, or this is a really bad, big battle, this is epic. I kind of look at it as, oh god, I just did that for 15 minutes and I still look like I've got another 20, 30 minutes left. And I don't know why I think like that. I don't know if it's a negative mentality, I don't know if it's... If it's, you know, subconsciously I don't want to be playing it or something. Because I was having a ton of fun playing a lot of this game. There were just certain moments where it was like, this really feels like I'm doing exactly what I'm doing. And I like it when it's more smoke and mirrors. But, Sniper Rifle takes the shield, the second bullet kills them. I personally think that should be a one bullet kill. 
It's a very powerful weapon. It requires skill to use. There's a failed smash attack that nearly gets me killed because I'm in the middle of a bunch of little shits that will kill you. How am I alive? Wow! That never happens, guys. It really doesn't. As much as I'd like to say I was in full control there and I'm an absolute genius, that they let me live. There's no other answer. And anyone who thinks they control those situations <laughs> has clearly got a higher impression of their own skill than it actually is. I should have died then. And I'm so glad I didn't because it's in the guide. And that's the most frustrating part of being a walkthrough maker. You get amazing pieces of gameplay where you're feeling yourself like you're Mike Ross during it. You know, you're getting hyped. You're shouting footsies for no real reason. And then you die and nobody gets to see it. And it's so frustrating. And you literally can do some of the best gameplay you've ever done. Some of the most epic looking encounters and it never makes the finished product. It's so strange. Oh, by the way, there is a lot of like little secrets to find in this game. So constantly be on the lookout for them because you can get some super cool stuff. And this is one of my favorite features of this game. I know the old Halos had it as well, but I probably wasn't as good at finding them. But this literally reminds me of Doom. It reminds me of Duke Nukem, it reminds me of Quake, it reminds me of that generation of first person shooters that I grew up playing. And I was a, a, a massive FPS scrub. I played Doom on the SNES. Which just sounds crazy, doesn't it? Doom on the SNES. Oh, the SNES. Was it the SNES that had Mortal Kombat, but there was no blood, so instead sand came out of people's faces? What was that about? It's up again, the, the message. I just didn't see it. Amazing. Maybe, I mean, the hood, if you think about it, the hood is really refined, it's really clean. It's got that shield in your life, it's got the little minimap, and that's it. It doesn't really clutter it with many other things. It's such a streamlined hood. It just blinds me. But this is a vehicle section. I'm going to say this because it needs to be said. The Warthogs control like shit. They always have. They always will. And I will never like them. But some people love them. Aiden. Probably Lummy. Like, a bunch of my friends who really like Halo have grown to truly appreciate the way the Warthogs control. I never will. I will always give them shit. I will always get into those funny arguments with my friends where I'm like, it's awful. But I don't know what it is. Far too much Halo 1 and the final mission. Which needs to be something I discuss in this guide, so I'm going to talk about it now before I forget. I keep reiterating a point that I'm not a Halo guy. And I'm doing this because there's a lot of really passionate Halo fans, and I just want it to be said that I'm not one of them. However, it ain't Halo until that final mission is a driving mission, and you're getting away from something that's either crumbling, exploding, or about to do both. I think they've kind of lost that. The first one had it, because I'll never forget it, because I never drove a Warthog in that entire game, and then I got to the end and I couldn't bloody do it. <laughs> because it's not the easiest driving section with some of the tricky like spaces you've got to go through, but then the, the car controls so bizarrely. <laughs> it controls like Resident Evil tank controls, only with slight camera manipulation. It's, it's, oh, it's so bad. It's going to be an interesting edit coming up here as well. Some weird sections about to traverse in the sequence. The Prometheans can steal the cars. And uh, that guy got murked, so eat my dick, friend. But I can't remember the second game. I'm almost certain they did it as an homage to the end of the first game. I'm certain Halo 3 had a driving sequence. And then I couldn't honestly tell you because I forgot the other ones. ODST, don't think it had one. I know there was a big road section towards the end of that game, but I couldn't tell you if it ended on one of those sequences. Reach, I'm almost certain didn't have a driving section at the end, but once again, could be wrong. I thought that game was really, really over-hyped and, and just completely over-appreciated. Everybody seemed to love it and all my friends, and I played it. I was like, yeah, it's Halo. Again. Uh, the... The jackals have got longer dreadlocks and, you know, people are wearing flares. Like, that was literally the only differences I felt. Oh, and there was now reticle bloom, which should never be in a Halo. But Halo 4, once again, almost certain there was no big driving section at the end of that. Didn't you get to the didact and then he just kind of made a speech and then fucked off? So, where has that gone, do you think? 
And I can tell you straight away in this game, the driving sequences are way more limited. Nowhere near as big or as, as expansive, nowhere near as, as intimidating if you don't like driving sections. But I think that's what made Halo, personally. I think it is those driving sections because it was always that choice they gave you. And this is a real dangerous spot. Whenever the Prometheans get close and start teleporting, they're going to come and try and punch you. And these dudes make almost no sound when they're close enough outside of the teleport noise. And they do lunging punches that one-shot you. Incredibly dangerous enemy up close, so be very careful, guys. Real dangerous. In a previous video, I was talking about Spartan Laser and asking for some clarification from some, some Halo guys. This is the, the railgun I was mentioning for the people who didn't know what I was talking about. You charge this gun up. Once it's fully charged, it fires off kind of a, an AOE grenade -y thing, even though it's meant to be a rail. And it's a pretty powerful gun. But considering how long you have to charge it, should it really take this long to kill fodder enemies? I don't think it should. And it's one of those disconnects that this game has. The bigger guns don't feel as good as they should. They don't feel as good as they look. And I'm almost certain if you hit somebody in the multiplayer with this, they will die. Why isn't it like that in the game? Isn't that the point of this gun? You don't get it often, but when you do, it's the fist of Jesus. Like, I'd, I, I don't understand it too much. But somebody left a, a comment talking about how a certain gun worked, and I don't think I worded my comment well enough to really uh, elucidate on on how it works. So the binary rifle. If anybody doesn't know, I think Halo 4 introduced it as kind of like a heavy alternative to a sniper. In this game it's a little different, I think, because that's what everybody keeps telling me anyway. I couldn't even remember. But how it works is you go into the scope and when you press the trigger it will fire a prolonged focused beam of energy for about three seconds and then it stops. And I believe the damage that the beam does is some of the high-end damage of the game. But once again, it feels really undernourished. It just doesn't seem to do the, the, the business that I wish it would do. And I think it's just a long-range damaging laser weapon. I think that's the, the full brunt and purpose of it. In the multiplayer, I can almost guarantee if you get that full laser on somebody, it's probably a kill. Because Halo's multiplayer seems really tight when it comes to what kills and what doesn't. Like, the only thing that I've ever really thought was shitty is anything that's fully automatic. You seem to have to shoot them a million times to get their shield down, and then they've backed up and one of their buddies has turned up and you get team killed by two of them. Like, that seems to be one of the Halo experiences. Oh, additionally here, folks, if you want to skip everything you just watched and rush through this mission, get all the way on top of here, break the vent on the roof, and you can immediately get in a tank. You'll notice at the beginning of the area, they said that there was a scorpion. It's in here. But I wanted to, to run around and, and see what we could pick up, see if I could get some good gear. And I'm currently rocking a sniper and a rocket launcher, which is not the smartest combination of weapons, but it's fun. But a couple more button swapping, and we're going to do some vehicle stuff. So the tank sections in this game, I find really disappointing. They feel shoehorned in. And I, coming from somebody who's you know played some of the older ones and really appreciated the scorpion sequences, I think they've managed to to make this scorpion feel nowhere near as fun as it used to. And I think it looks cool as shit. It looks really badass, especially when you have all your team hanging off of it. But you shoot people with the tu the turret gun, and they don't die. They take like the normal enemies take two shots. And I think there's something just unsatisfying about having a slow firing heavy weapon that doesn't kill things and I'm gonna talk about that actually because there is a mantis in this game which is some of the most boring sequences in it and I don't think it should have been so the mantis if, any, if you don't know is a mech it's a mech that you climb in and I believe it was in Halo 4 loads of games have obligatory mech sections but not all games do them very well a couple of games that I think did them really well. Wolfenstein, The New Order. There was a sequence in that where you got in a mech and you just wrecked shop. The, the machine gun you had tore people in half. The rockets you had destroyed buildings. Like, it felt like you were this killing machine. However, if you took too much focus fire, you could die. You died quite quickly, considering that you were in a mech, but you killed super quick. And I think that is as satisfying and as boldening and powering as it can get. Another great game that did it well, Fear 2. Fear 2 had a mech that just turned people into cereal, dude. It literally turned them into just sprays of Cheerios. It was amazingly good. Like crimson Halloween themed Cheerios. And you felt 
lethal. You felt like the Ed 209. Straight up, you know, I think you better do what he says. And then your torso turns into just an eruption of squibs, which were glorious. Where have they gone? This digital blood is just not doing it for me. All hail the, uh, the 90s and the, the late 80s. Oh, that's something interesting too. That image just then, of that glowing blue light, signifies a spawn point. It's going to signify Promethean spawns for the rest of the game. So if you learn where they are, you can get spawn kills on them with grenades or heavy weapons, and you can completely mitigate entire spawns. It is really cool, and I, and I like that. It reminds me of the emergence holes. Anything that allows you to have an advantage via knowledge is a great thing. But this is going to be a good example of, of why I think that the tank is, is just not as fun as it should be. And I remember it being so much more just deadly. You had to respect the tanks. And funny thing is, you, you have to respect the tanks that are the enemy tanks on this, because they one-shot you, for the most. But on this, like, how are they still alive? Fodder normal dudes. I just, I don't know. And I love how the shell gets ejected and does that lazy flip out of the, uh, the chamber. Some really nice touches. It's a beautiful game. There's a spawn. There's an attempted spawn kill. I don't know. I'm curious what you uh, Halo guys think, because I, I noticed that this tank felt super different in this game. Uh, is that me just placeboing it and misremembering, or is it straight up not the Scorpion that you used to love? Because I just, I'm on fire at the moment. The good news is there is a checkpoint coming up, but, like, couldn't you used to shoot the machine gun on this as well as shooting the turret? I pressed all the buttons, but I couldn't get the machine gun to do anything. I don't know if it's just I didn't figure it out right or what, but... There was the checkpoint, by the way. So, even though your tank is on fire, you should be okay. And you don't have to stay in the vehicles, which is my favourite part of the vehicle sections in this game. You can get out and book it, and sometimes it's a much better strategy. There are, I think, two sequences which I think are intended to be in the vehicles, which I'm going to do without vehicles, because it's just... It's the way that I found success. And... As much as I want these walkthroughs to help as many people as I can, if they're not working out for you and you're not getting the same patterns or strategies that I'm doing here, you know, try your own, guys. That's what it's all about. The guides are not there to replace how you think. They're there to augment the way you think and add to your own strategies. And I think a lot of people forget that. Which is why I get these preposterous comments of, My game doesn't work like your game. Well, of course not. It's, it's RNG, dude. That's what games are. That's what makes them cool. However, my video shows that it can be done this way. All you have to do is assign, assemble those pieces together and get a little lucky. And everything else is, is hopefully on you. So when I hear people like, this doesn't work, you know, this strategy doesn't work, all I, all I can think is, you can't do it. Doesn't mean it doesn't work. It means you are incapable of getting the same results that I did. But when you tell people that, they get offended. And I, and I just don't understand that at all. Like, I can't speak French. I'm not going on French videos and saying you're a bad teacher just because I can't learn French. You know, it's, it's just that weird thing. Although I don't think making walkthroughs is anything like teaching a foreign language because a foreign language is, I think it's like being a magician. And, and I say this all the time. I am fascinated by people who have the, the perseverance and the skill to, to do that because I, I was pretty good at Spanish while I was at school. I got into the top set and I, and I had promising prospects, but once I left school, never touched it again. And it sucks and I've lost literally most of what I learned, which is a big shame. Not that I would, if I could speak any language, it would obviously be something like Japanese or, or maybe some form of Chinese like Mandarin or Cantonese because you know they're gonna take over, dude. The red dragon is rising. But this is the end of the section. And it is the end of the mission. So thank you very much for watching, and you take care now.